Hey guys, and welcome to today's episode of the Mogul Insider Podcast. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing my man, Brett Knudsen, or as I'd like to call him, the Billion Dollar Networker. This guy has created so much success around him, it's absolutely unbelievable. He's taken multiple companies from zero, scaling them all the way to six, seven, and even eight figures. And he's most popularly known by the social media app that he created and co-founded called Hive. And in this episode, we give you the insider scoop of what it took from him to go from absolutely broke. He got kicked out of his house when he was growing up while watching his mom go through bankruptcy. And if that wasn't hard enough, he had to also travel to San Francisco to start his company and live with 23 people in a 1,200 square foot house. I mean, how ridiculous is that? He also shares with us how he had a specific budget for food and how sometimes he only could eat once every other day. And after working for 20 months on a business with absolutely no return and was about to completely give up, he got a $150,000 phone call that completely changed the quality of his life. So let me tell you guys, this episode is a killer and I am so happy to be sharing this one with you guys. So without further ado, relax, kick back, and take some notes and I hope you guys enjoy. Welcome to today's episode of Mogul Insider Podcast. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Brett Knudsen. I apologize, I said that correctly, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Um, he is the CEO and founder of Hive App, also a billionaire celebrity networker, and has many other ventures under his name. Definitely a real pleasure to be sitting down with you today. Thank you so much for being hey, on the show. Thank we you. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. So let's go ahead and get this rolling. So a lot of people know you as, uh, we were just talking about it, a lot of people know you as the founder and the CEO of Hive. So tell me a bit about how that started, where you are today, and we'll take it from there. We'll see where, where this all goes with. Cool. So Hive started uh, in 2013, mm -hmm. and it started out as like a solution for my mom. So my mom's chronically disabled, so I wanted there to be a way for her to easily make friends. And Hive just helps you connect with people who are nearby that share the same interests as you. So it's a good way for you to connect with people and, and make new friends around shared interests. And uh, I moved out to Silicon Valley in 2014 to try and raise money. We ended up raising money from the co-founder of EA Games. And now we've raised a few million dollars and uh, we, we partner with a lot of celebrities and influencers to help promote. So this whole idea came from the inspiration of trying to help out your mother. Tell me a bit about yeah. that. and. Where that came, where that ride, where that want, that ambition and passion to actually want to do something started, because a lot of people have issues with their families, but they never actually take action. Yeah, so I think I think most people um, don't realize how important like the why is when you're starting something, because it's really hard to be an entrepreneur, and if your why is just making money, I don't think that it's enough to get over some of the hurdles and stuff that people come across. So. For me, I didn't even realize that, but uh, it started with my mom because my mom's kind of like been there for me my whole life, obviously, and is kind of like my rock and uh, my, my good friend. And so when she got diagnosed with some of her disabilities and it caused her to lose her license, um, she really just kind of was at home by herself all day. My parents are divorced, and so um, she would live vicariously through her kids. She would like call us all the time and ask you know, how we were doing because she was always doing nothing. And so I wanted to create uh, solution for her and obviously I didn't realize how hard that was going to be um, but it's kind of like when you're climbing a mountain and you're halfway up it's just as hard to go to the top as it is to go back down so you started so. this whole thing just because of her that was your goal mm -hmm. you had no like motivation to make any sorts of money impact other people you just wanted to help your mother's life originally yeah. better yeah that is that is beautiful did you grow up with her or like were you because you said your parents were divorced so were you more with her or with your father they had split custody so I was with you know, one week and one week kind of alternating. So. Tell me, tell me if you don't mind, can we, can we dig more into that? Yeah, tell, yeah, me, yeah. tell me more about that, uh, growing up in an environment like that, because, you know, I see a lot of people with families that are split, issues like that, and they, they victimize themselves and they blame themselves. Looking at you now, being successful where you are today, would you think that was a factor to helping you become who you are today because you were able to manifest everything from there? Yeah, well, it definitely was because I wouldn't have started Hive if it hadn't been for my mom. Um, but I, I don't know if the, if the divorce impacted me and like made me an entrepreneur or anything like that. Um, but I do think that I would have done something else and probably something more simple. 
Um, cause I was very naive when I started Hive. Like it was, I didn't realize, you know, like starting a social network is like the hardest thing that anybody can do. Yeah. Cause in order to be successful, you need millions of people using it, you know, every month. And you were just and, looking at one person. Yeah. And, uh, so I was just trying to create a solution for her, not really thinking about what that meant at the time. And, uh, it, it's turned into what it has now. So yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful. You, you were telling me before we got on camera over here that you actually wanted to get into football. So you had other ambitions and other passions before beginning this company. Yeah. So let's let's dig more into that and how, how, how you 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 ended up you were telling me you ended up going through an injury was it? Uh, kind of. I uh, so I was in a really bad car accident. Okay. Um, right after I graduated high school, and I had you know I had the opportunity where I could have played football in, in college and everything, and I lost that opportunity because I lost the ability to play contact sports um, from the injuries that I got in the car accident. And so that kind of changed the trajectory of my life because I, I was going to go to school for like psychology or something because it was interesting to me and mostly go for football. And when I found that I wasn't going to be able to do that anymore, I decided not to go to college. Uh, you so. dropped out of college because you couldn't finish sports? Because I couldn't play sports, yeah. Really? That's that, that, was, that was your motivation? Well, I, I, yeah, and I, I didn't want to pay, pay for college. I didn't understand why going, you know, a hundred thousand dollars into debt was like a good decision. We were talking about so, that. Just yeah. right now. <laughs> it was that. So did you have a plan B when you, when you dropped out? Or were you just kind of, uh, well, so I, I, I found sales, which I think is what like a lot of lost, like, <laughs> you know, like college dropout, like people do. I found sales. What I liked about it was, um, I felt like I was earning a paycheck, not just collecting one. And I also felt like it was my ability to earn, closer to what I felt I was worth than something I was hourly. So I loved sales. No one told me that it was supposed to be hard. So I excelled because I didn't have any like preconceived notion in my head. And uh, I ended up going into like sales consulting and sales management and stuff for a while before I started Hive. So that was kind of my, my path I was on. How long did you do um, that for? About three years. Yeah. And you were how old at that age? Uh, 20. I was 21 uh, when I when I was like doing a sales training, sales consulting, I was like 22 when I started Hive. Okay, all right. Yeah. So you started Hive, you raised money, now your life is changing dramatically, very mm -hmm. quickly I imagine, correct? Tell me the process you went through to be able to manage everything and stay calm and collective you left, you left, did you leave your mom's house? Were you guys living together at that time or? No, I, no, I was living on my own. Um, but I left Minnesota. Like I, so I'm from Minnesota and I, I left to, originally I went to Lawrence, Kansas mm -hmm. of all places because I, I had thought that I had found like a development team down there that could develop Hive. Um, but really I just went cause I just, I moved preemptively before the deal was done cause I just wanted to get out of Minnesota cause I knew that, you know, nothing was going to happen for me there. And, you know, as if something would happen for me in Lawrence, Kansas, but I moved to, to Lawrence and that didn't end up working out. So then I was there for like a couple months and I met up with a mentor and he's like, you're wasting your time. You need to be in Silicon Valley. Like that's where people raise money. And so we picked up and moved and I didn't even have a place to stay. We drove out to Silicon Valley, took like three days and, uh, we were like prepared to sleep in our car and everything. And we found a place last Just minute. Leave. So my, my co-founder and I for, okay. for Hive, yeah. And uh, so we drove out to Silicon Valley and um, we found a place, it was like a little 1,200 square foot shack. And I say shack intentionally, like it had not been updated in probably 100 years. And uh, the floor was eroding from earthquakes, but they didn't care to fix it. So okay. there's like dirt, like you're, this is like a dirt floor and wood mixed Inside in. Of the place. Inside, yeah. and there's like bugs and like it's really disgusting. Did you come from and a household that was wealthy, or were you guys no. middle class? How would you describe uh, your family? So it was weird because I grew up middle class, but when my parents got divorced, my mom was financially destitute, so she went through bankruptcy and foreclosure, and so I went back and forth between a life where I had everything I needed, you know, like clothes and food, to uh, like like I said, week week on week off, and I went to live with my mom who had nothing. And I'm talking like, I would have to like try and bring clothes over and like, you know, kind of like smuggle stuff that I needed to, to her house. And so <coughs> it was a really weird 
thing that to go through, I think, psychologically, like as you're going through high school, to go be- between like two extremes. And, uh, but I, you know, I grew up with everything that I needed. I wasn't like poor or anything um, until my parents got divorced and then my mom was. But to, to like sleep on a floor, I mean, I didn't even have the mattress. Like I couldn't afford a mattress. So when you moved into this place in Silicon Valley. Yeah. So to sleep on a floor that was eroding with like dirt and like bugs and stuff was that I had never done anything like that. And uh, it was all I could afford. I mean, I had two, literally, I remember seeing 0.02 in my bank account for the longest time. Two cents, two Two cents, cents. two cents. And when I lived out there, I lost 70 pounds from like malnutrition. Just because you you weren't eating. Yeah, I would eat once every other day. And I had about a a budget of about a dollar a day for food. So I could either... You're living in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Well, Guys, too, if, if you don't know what Silicon Valley is, Google search that stuff because it's probably what, what the most expensive... Most expensive zip code in North America. Yeah, and you had a dollar budget for food. For food. Well, because rent, our rent was like $2,000. <laughs> for and, and I'll keep in mind, so illegally modified 1,200 square foot house. And if you were thinking that I was living in... Uh, I had the house to myself, that's wrong. So we shared the house, 1,200 square feet, with like 23 people. So there's a family of six that lived in just one of the bedrooms. And we all shared like one bathroom, we all shared one kitchen, we all shared one fridge. Like that many people sharing one fridge is like ridiculous. So um, for me, I would either eat like one McChicken a day or um, I would not eat for a day and then eat like half of a Little Caesars pizza and then save the other half, not eat, and then eat the other half like on day four. And so I I probably ate like a hundred Little Caesars pizzas that year, but it was like every other day I'd eat a half a pizza. And so I lost 70 pounds. I was like very underweight at that point. And then of course moved back to Minnesota where there's, uh, you know, grandma and comfort food and gained a lot of it back. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that was a crazy part of my life. For so sure. you're, so let's, 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 let's take you through the first night of when you move in. You're mm-hmm. laying down on the floor. I, I had like a little thin, like comforter thing. Cool. Let's call it a yeah. little, like little mini mattress. All right. You're looking up to this, wall above you yeah what the heck is going on through your head at first when I got there I was just so excited to be there um but as time went on and I realized that just because you moved Silicon Valley doesn't mean you get money that started to really weigh on me because um I remember it, it had been about 13 or 12 12 or 13 months think about yeah I know it was a full year mark so I'd been there for a full year and I still hadn't raised any money and um, I'd burned some opportunities because I would I would get like a really big meeting like I remember one time I landed a meeting with the co-founder of TechCrunch who's like mm. had started several other big companies prior in the UK his name's Keith Tier he's a good friend of mine now um, but I, I was so excited I went to his house and I was like ready to present or whatever and uh, I, I felt so stupid because I didn't have like the basic stuff that I was supposed to have. Um, and I didn't know, like there was no, you know, like instruction manual on, on, like, how to do, yeah. on how to pitch. Yeah, well on how to have a social network or like how to raise money or whatever. So for me, I didn't know like what an MVP was, I, like which is minimum viable product. You know, it's, I, I didn't know what uh, pitch deck was and so like I, I landed this big opportunity and I, I wasted it because he's like dude you need like this you need this and uh, like I said we're friends now and I actually interviewed him for like a project I did a while ago but um, <laughs> so for me like after being out there a year and still not raising any money I, that was like very depressing it was very hard for me and um, I, I like to kind of I, I, I think sometimes I like to lie to myself because I'll, you know, like I remember when I was out there after a year and I was like, oh, I'm not quitting. I'm just going to go back to Minnesota and like raise money there. Dude, the whole reason why I moved to California was because I knew I couldn't raise money in Minnesota, right? So like, I'm like, I'm just going to go back to Minnesota. It'll be easier. Like, <laughs> to I'll sleep on the floor. You know, I'll be like, I, it'll be easier on me mentally. I'll be in a better state and I'll be able to raise money. I'm sure I'll raise money by it. So I bought a plane ticket, but I bought it for a month out which is also another excuse because I was like, oh, I'm sure in a month I'll probably close something here and I won't even need it and I'll just go back to Minnesota. It'll be great. <laughs> Playing these mind games. I'm literally quitting, right? Yeah. Like that, that's what I was basically doing. And the day after I bought the plane ticket, I got a $150,000 phone call. Really? Mm-hmm. 
can't make it up at 8 a.m. in the morning. Okay, so wait, we we'll stop for right, yeah. right there for a second. Take me through everything that happened that day. Like, like you pick up the phone, and in your head, you're already thinking of quitting, but giving yourself excuses on why you're not quitting because a quitter is a loser. You don't want to be a loser. I'm sure you were thinking about that. And then you get this phone call. So, so the phone call was from the co-founder of EA Games, Electronic Arts, and he had been advising us for a while, which is like, that's a tip that I always like to give is like, if you want, if you want advice, ask for money. If you want money, ask for advice, sure, right? Advice. And so um, every time I asked for money, all I would get is like tips, you know, you really ought to. And so I, I started asking for advice and I found, so you know, really, really successful people would come in and, and give me advice and try and help. But over giving me the advice, they would see that I would execute on what they would recommend I do. And they would, so they'd see the execution, they'd see the follow through, they'd get to know my character as they got to know me. And they, and in this case, he practically was like grooming the company and grooming me for an investment. So I'd known him for six months which is another reason why I was going to give up. Cause I was like, if this is the only guy who's, who has a shot of maybe being interested in investing and he's probably not going to, or he would have by now. So I, when he, when he called me, I was going to pick up the, the phone and say, Hey, like, I just want to let you know, I decided to go back to Minnesota and like try and weave my right, like weave my way around the fact that he was going to probably drill me and say, you're you know foolish for doing that. You're not going to do anything and try and make excuses. But before I could explain myself, he's like, uh, you know, we f we filled your round. We're gonna give you one hundred fifty thousand, and that was like the most insane. I can't explain. Like, it felt better to hear that than like when we got two million later. Like it, like hearing one hundred fifty thousand was like that. It was just like life. A game changer. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, after twenty months. So I came up with the idea twenty months prior. So almost two years of like just nothing. How big was your team at that time? It was just you and your co-founder at that time still? So it was me and my co-founder. I mean, we didn't have anybody on staff. No one was getting paid, yeah. obviously. It was me and my co-founder. Um, and then we had some other people uh, uh, who were like equity holders in, in the company. So we had like a designer. We had an attorney, which was like a, a really big win. We landed a really big attorney who was willing to do like hundreds of, what ended up being hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of legal work for equity. Um, and then my cousin who's like my right hand guy to this day. And that was us five were equity holders, but it was just us two that were out in California kind of doing the day to day stuff. Wow. And so let's take it back to when you said that most people don't understand that there is a big reason to have a why in what you do. So your why was your mother. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs struggle to find their why. What's your biggest advice or top three things that you would say to guide people to find their why and how to do it? So your why has to be way bigger than money. Um, and, and if it is money, like you will end up failing uh, because entrepreneurship is so hard that no matter how money motivated you are, it's not going to be enough because there's easier ways to make money. That's the biggest thing. There are easier ways to make money than entrepreneurship. So if you're money motivated and something hard comes along, you're going to take the easy way out where you can just make money. Hmm and just try and get a high paying job or something, right? And so your why, you have to have your own personal why, and I also think you have to have like a company why. So your company has to have its own like persona, vision, mission. Story. It's like its own entity, right, that people can <clears throat> latch onto. Because people don't latch onto a what or a how, they latch onto a why. And so nobody's gonna wanna work for your company, nobody's gonna wanna buy from your company, no one's gonna wanna do anything with your company if you don't have a why. And then your personal why is what helps you get through the struggles uh, that are all the time. And I would say like in entrepreneurship, the lows are way more frequent than the highs. Um, but typically the highs are bigger than the lows. Not always, but typically. And that's what makes it worth it, right? Um, but the why has to be something that you would do anything for. So, you know, if you have kids, it could be your kids. Um, you know, if you have a wife or... A significant other or a family member or someone who you care deeply about or it can be um, it could just be about a cause that means a lot to you you know like means to an end for some issue that you want to solve in the world or whatever but you need to have something that's bigger than money
I see. I see. And has your why still continued to be your mother until today? Uh, not exactly because like I've solved the problem okay. for her. Um, I mean, I would say like it's, it motivates me to want to help her because she doesn't have a lot of money and I want to, you know, continue to help her live like a higher quality life. But, um, my why definitely now I'm married and I have kids. So it's, you're married. Yeah. It's my family. Yeah. No way. Yeah. What? I yeah. have no idea. That's crazy. How many yeah. kids you got? So I have, I have three kids. Yeah, yeah. You, wow, man, that just yeah. threw me off. Yeah. I did not expect that to come. That's that's great. When did you get married? So I got married a year ago. Two of my kids are stepkids, but to me, they're they're my yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, Congratulations, so it's, uh, thank man. you. It's a yeah. little late, but yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have a little baby girl, and then we have a f I have a four and a five year old uh, sons. Wow. Yeah. Wow, man. So, so tell me about now. So you're a family man. Mm -hmm. So how has your perception of the hustle changed ever since you got married? How is my perception of what changed? The hustle. The hustle. So, you know, that's interesting because I, I was, I try to surround myself with mentors I look up to in every way. And, and that's hard, right? So like we're talking people who have like family figured out, they have like finances figured out, they have their spiritual life figured out, they have it all figured out. That's hard to find somebody like that. Yeah. And uh, I have a mentor who lives in Canada and he's got the most beautiful life. Runs several multi-million dollar businesses and contributes massively. He's on the board of several massive charities. Um, super like strong faith, great family, like fantastic relationship with his wife and kids. Like just an amazing man. And I asked him, I was like, how do you find time for everything? Like, yeah. And he said, uh, I don't. He said, I make time. And he said, you're going to have to make sacrifices uh, for your priorities. And he said, because if you try and find time for your family, you won't. Hmm. You try and find time for your faith, you won't. He said, you have to make time. And he said, that comes at an expense. He said, I have literally missed huge business opportunities because I, I was making time for my family. And so for me, um, the hustle has changed because my priorities have changed. So... I would say that I focus more on the quality of, of my time than the quantity. So I don't try to work as much as I can. I try to work as smart as I can and I try to put as much like into the hours I'm working as I can. But then similarly when I'm at home and I'm with my family, I try to you put as much as I can into those hours too. So I'm I'm not uh, you know, playing video games or watching TV, I'm actively engaged with my kids and with my wife. So that's, uh, that's what's changed for me. Nice, nice, man. And has your motivation, so your motivation is now your kids, your, your wife, yeah. your family, this is what you do, this is why you do it. So how about for the people that don't have for mm -hmm. the people that don't have a family, because there, there, there are people out there who lost their family, lost yeah. their loved ones. They're alone. They don't really even have friends. Yeah. It's very unfortunate, but we see people like that that want to change the world, that really want to make a difference but don't know where to start, can't find their why, and just don't know where to turn to or who to talk to. What's the first step for them? It's still a why. So, um, it, it, like, like I said before, it doesn't have to be family. It doesn't have to be friends. It can be a cause. But if it's, if it's just you, like, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that I really believe is that it's, if you have the opportunity to be wealthy, then it's selfish to be poor. Hmm. Because when you're poor, all you're thinking of is yourself. And like I said, the, the key differentiator there is if you have the opportunity to be wealthy. And I understand that not everybody has that opportunity. When um, you say that, though, what do you mean by if? Don't you create your opportunities? Yeah, but uh, like there are some severely limiting mental disabilities and things that, I yeah. Um, so, but if you have the ability to be wealthy, um, you're doing the world a disservice by not being it. Uh, like if being poor, all you're thinking of is your next bills, like your next check and like how you're going to pay your bills that's not a way to be in service to the world. And so um, you should be thinking of what causes are important to you and what really pulls on, on your heart and make that your why. I see, okay. So now you have kids, they're mm -hmm. growing up. They're gonna have to end up going to school. I know you yeah. said, let's keep this towards the end, but this might be a big conversation, yeah, so yeah. I wanna bring it up. 
what is your opinion on school and what are the <coughs> top lessons you would teach your kids today growing through this society on what to do and how to grow and how to become successful? So, uh, with all I, the lessons yeah, you've learned, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so I, I definitely feel like school failed me, um, and everybody would look at it the opposite and say like I failed school. Um, but I think that if you have a system that is stagnant in a world that's changing, that's a bad system, and that's the system we have for sure. I mean, you have. Uh, you know, when we're talking like a hundred years ago and the assembly line was a huge thing, you need people to be machines. So it makes sense for them to like all sit in rows and like all do what they're told and all learn the same thing because they're all going to be doing the same thing. Well, it's not the case anymore. So we need a system that caters to the individual and we don't have that. And so for me, um, the easy, the easy way out is to just pull your kids out of the system, but then you're not helping the problem, right? So you see a lot of people doing that, right? Like one, one of my things that I want to do is I want to, I call it world school, my kids, which means that, you know, instead of saying, look, uh, turn to page 56 and see the pyramids, it's look to your left, right? But that's, that's, take them to the yeah. So, but like, that's obviously there's a lot of costs associated with that. And, you that's, know, that's pretty paying cool. A teacher to come <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, got, you got an extra room for an adoption? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but like that's, that's, uh, that's, that's only solving the problem for my kids. Uh -huh. So I'm really passionate about education reform, and that's like kind of like my big, like, big scary goal. Yeah, you were telling me about for, that. For like at the end of my life, I want to say that I made a, a massive impact. Why do you on, say scary though? Uh, because it's so, I, there's, it's impossible for me to do it alone. Um, so it, the amount of resources and influence that it would take to impact that big of a system would take a massive team of people who are all influential, all, uh, like wealthy and you know, like it, it, it's something that you have to put together. It's not something that any one person can make a significant dent in without help. And so that's why, um, that's why it's a really big undertaking. You know what I mean? Like yeah. every, er, everybody who, uh, Everybody who says they're self-made is lying. Um, I, I understand how much hard work that each individual person um, puts into getting to where they're at. But I mean, like, everything that I've ever done has gotten to where it's gotten to with, with fantastic people. Like a team of fantastic people who've all put in their part in areas where I'm weak and I just try and focus on my strengths. Um, but something like that would be such a massive undertaking and it would take decades and decades. It'd be like, it'd be my life legacy, not just Have another you started business. going on that track trying to figure things out with it? Um, slowly, I'm trying to start by figuring it out for my kids and then end by figuring it out like as a system for everybody. You know, I love how everything you started, started for somebody directly in front of you. You know, first it was your mother. So you understood, like, you gave yourself, like, a physical goal, like, something that you could, like, really, like, visualize and obtain. And now you're, like, thinking of how can I solve this problem for my kids and duplicate it a billion times, mm -hmm. practically, is what you're pretty much doing. Very, very cool, man. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a really interesting goal. I've never, I've never sat with anyone who told me I want to impact the school system. A lot of people talk about, you know, school is bad, this and that, and how they directly worked on it for themselves, but nobody actually cared enough to want to make a big impact in this world. Uh, so let's let's dig deep into your, your way of thinking. Okay. So what is uh, what is your typical day look like? Do you have certain routines set up, certain systems, processes that you have set up that allow you to accomplish so many things at a given 24-hour period? Yeah, um, my my day-to-day my -day is definitely different. Uh, every day, my routines in the morning and at night are the same or close to the same. Um, but I, I travel a lot for work so that that's one big, uh, difference. I would say that, you know, obviously like when I wake up in the morning, I have a whole routine that I go through that involves reading and it involves, you know, praying and meditating and all sorts of things that I think are healthy and, and good for like you, you have to take care of yourself first before you can take care of other people. Mm -hmm. It's like when you're on a plane and they say, you know, please put the, if there's a change in cabin pressure, put your oxygen mask on first before helping someone else. Uh huh. Because you'll die if you're yeah. trying to help someone else first. So um, 
making sure that you're prioritizing yourself, your relationship with God, if you believe in God, like prioritize that time in the morning. And then um, from there on out, your day will go a lot better. So I, I definitely start with with routines in the morning. And then from there, I go to uh, typically, if I'm back at home in Minnesota, it's a lot of virtual communication. Mm -hmm. So it's FaceTimes, it's calls and meetings and emails and stuff like that. If I'm traveling, it's a lot of in-person. Uh, so just going around and meeting with people for the different projects and stuff that I'm working on. Um, and then if I'm home, it's, you know, at the end of the day, spending time with family. Do you do any uh, personal self-development on a daily basis? Do you do anything to help you? Like, what, what's, your, uh, what's your practice to help you continuously grow and learn on a, on a consistent basis? Yep, so part of my morning routine is reading. Okay. So I have, like, whatever book I'm currently going through. Right now it's Principles by Ray Dalio, which is a really good book. Okay. Um, and so reading is a part of my, my You're everyday. You're like the third person that told me that this week. The principles, yeah, yeah. you should. It, it's a fantastic book. He's yeah. the most successful hedge fund manager of all time. Yeah, and he <laughs> he's uh, he's put together a book in in a very methodical way. Like yeah. his success is is like written written out in different principles that he that he has. So it's pretty cool. Um, so I'm I'm reading that right now, and then uh, I don't I don't learn very well through audio. So I don't listen to audiobooks. I wish I I could. Every time yeah. I try to listen to an audiobook, my mind kind of. I'm the same way. Right? I, I try to open one up, and I'm like, I don't even understand half of the words. It's not like the, I don't speak the language. It's just a matter of like my mind just thinks of different things. I get yeah. Then, I get and then, then, then you like come back and you realize that you've been thinking of like some business you could start or something <laughs> yeah. for like thirty minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I definitely like I read physical books, um, but that's that's a big part of my personal development. And then I watch a lot of YouTube. So, um, like mentors, I, I have, I like to say I have like mentors in real life and then I have like virtual mentors, okay. which are the authors whose books I read and the people whose videos I watch. Cool. I'm glad you brought the whole idea of mentors right before we started this podcast, we were talking about, uh, effective communication and effective delivery and how to build a proper relationship. Mm -hmm. So let's brush up a little bit about that. I think the audience would really like what you have to say beforehand. So, how does somebody build a proper relationship to achieve the utmost success out of it in the future? Yeah, I think that that's, in my opinion, that's the most important question that, that anybody can ask ever. And it's because, uh, like, I don't think people realize how critical relationships are to everything. Absolutely everything. And so building relationships the right way is something that most people don't do uh, very well. Why do you think that happens? Um, I think, I think that most people are well intentioned, but understandably, especially when you're first starting out, I think that most people are self seeking. Right? We just talked about helping yourself before you can help others. Yeah. Um, but ironically, the best way to help yourself is to help others when it comes to relationship building. Okay. And so when you're building relationships, um, I would say like average people seek to, um, figure out what they can get from someone. And that's that like that's okay. It's not like a bad thing. It's just, it's just the facts. Most people seek to, you know, figure out what they can get from somebody. Um, above average people try to add value first and exceptional people add value repeatedly without s expecting anything in return, but extremely unusual and outstanding relationship builders add value repeatedly. They don't expect anything in return. And when they have the opportunity to get something in return from the person that they've helped, they recycle the value onto somebody else in their network. Is there a real life example that you can give us on how you've been able to do exactly just that? Every single day. Uh, every single day, people that I'm meeting up with, I try and figure out how I can add value or how I can help them. And typically it's by introducing them to the, to the right people. Um, that's a very easy way to help somebody. Um, other ways that you can help people is by um, skills that you have. So you can offer to help through skills that you have. You can also um, help in ways that are not business related. People don't seem to realize that business people are also human beings. Yes. Uh, so you can help by just being a, a good listener. If they've gone through a breakup recently or something traumatic has happened in their family, you can just be a good friend. Um, you can help by giving them advice in their relationships or in their spiritual walk or whatever. Like, I mean, there's different ways you can add value to a person. And once you've added value to the person, um, Typically, if they're a high-quality person, 
they're, uh, there's kind of like a law of reciprocity. They'll feel uncomfortable just receiving. Hmm. So they're going to want to give back. And when they give back, instead of taking that opportunity for yourself, which is very hard to not do, you should take that opportunity as a way for you to help someone else because that will in the long run be what's best for you a hundred percent i see i see and do you think that those higher a class players are harder to reach to or do you think they're actually a lot easier if you just attempt to establish a relationship their debt their their walls are a lot higher okay um but if you if you if you use those methods um, the walls will take a little bit longer to break down. You'll have to add value more than once. Um, but once the walls are down, they're just going to be so enamored and so shocked by how much you stand out and how unusual it is that you sincerely don't want something from them. Because all powerful people are used to people who want something from them. And if you can be the one person that doesn't want something from them, that's going to stand out tremendously to them. And the biggest thing is like when they ask, you know, hey, how can I help you? Which like the way that I've seen these really high profile people respond to that is uh, it's almost with like on like there's like a sense of like uncomfort because they you can tell they're getting ready for a really big ask. Like, like, oh, like okay. when, they're, they're, when they're like, all right, like you help me, like, you know, how can I help you? And you can just tell they're just like, oh, damn, yeah. and so if you if you respond and you just say, you know, the, the way that you can best help me is by just being available for somebody else that needs help from someone like you. That's going to just floor any high it's gonna profile. Tri- it's going to completely trip them Yes. Up. And you will never be forgotten by that person. And the best part is, no matter how important they are, because they're a high quality person or they never would have gotten to where they got to in the first place, if you do need their help in the future, they'll be there, there instantly. There. Yes. They're right, like speed dial. And they'll over deliver. Yeah. Really? A hundred percent. Wow. That's, 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 that's great advice for everybody that's watching because I, I personally have had issues um, not developing relationships. It's more so being intimidated by it. Mm-hmm. So I, I've had that where I would be in front of an opportunity in front of somebody and I would just be intimidated by the fact that, wait, like, holy shit, like this guy is right next to me. You know, like, like what am I supposed to do? I have limited time. What should yeah. I do? How should I deliver? Like, should I talk about this? Should I not talk about that? And every time I leave, I'm like, oh, I should have talked about that instead of this. And just a bunch of variables kick in, and I never really understand up until recently. Actually, just right now, this really gave me a great, you know, visualization of how to take things and how to flip them to where they are. So, um, though, with that being said, though, how do you remove the initial intimidation that you may have from as a beginner entrepreneur? Because we, we all go through this. I mean, and we all we all understand. And a lot, I'm sure a lot of us out there, I mean, I personally have been through it, where I felt like I wasn't good enough. And how do you find the value that you can to deliver to that other person? Because, like, that guy has everything. Yeah. That guy has all the resources in the world. I mean, not literally, but I'm sure, they, I'm sure they're very well connected. They have, they have the money. Money is nothing to them, so you can't do that. So how are you able to really pinpoint the value that you can deliver for them? So... Typically, it's just by uh, successful people value their time. So if you can save them time, uh, that's worth tremendous amounts of money to them. And so a lot of times you can save someone time by introducing them to somebody. And, you know, it, it's easy to argue that these successful people, you know, if they tried hard enough, they could get a relationship or they could, you know, get the phone number they want or whatever. And that's true, but... A lot of times they don't know who that person is that they actually should be talking to. And if they do know who it is, it's always better to have a warm introduction from a trusted friend. Mm-hmm. And it moves a relationship along a lot faster. So that's that's the biggest way that I add value. And for a long time, I had to kind of just put my head down and try and build my network in whatever way that I could until it was big enough that I had people I could introduce other people to. Um, but the most important thing to understand is that I started from nothing. Like I, I literally, I had no network. I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> like that alone, yeah, like I, I have no, no network from Minnesota, from a small town. I was, uh, grew up in a township, which what, is, what, what is that uh, it's exactly? terminology for a place so small it's not legally considered a town or a city. Really? How many township, people do you have in the township? 600. 
Six hundred people. Six hundred people. So you guys all knew each other. Yeah. Oh yeah. Nearest gas station was uh, twenty miles away. Twenty miles. And it was where my high school was, and the nearest town you where that gas station was was. School? Yeah, it okay. was uh, a town of seventeen thousand people. Half the town was the colleges that were there. It wasn't the actual population of the town. So I mean, I there are no meaningful like connections that come from that type of upbringing. None. And so when people say like, oh, it's all about who you know, like it's an excuse. Yeah. That's in your control. You could start. Getting yeah. Like, like people. who, you know, How like did you that. start actually, what did you do? So like, I know you yeah. were in Silicon Valley, you put yourself in the right place. That's key. yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean like you can start from anywhere. Most people, if you don't have like a rich uncle or something cliche, there's somebody in your extended family or extended family friend that is kind of like known as like the successful guy. Well, yeah. try and get a lunch with him, offer to buy him lunch or whatever. Most people who got to somewhere significant are willing to at least try. I mean, it's a little bit different with social media now because now if you're successful, you might have millions of people trying to hit you up. That's hard to navigate that and try and add value to everybody. But for the most part, if there's someone locally successful, like they'll sit down and have lunch with you because someone did that to them when they had nothing to, to bring to the table. Yeah, I think a lot of us forget that these successful people also came from nothing. Yeah, and that's, yeah. that's where, because you said, how do you not get intimidated? By knowing that. That they came from nothing. Yeah. Everybody, like, everybody is a person. Like, don't treat people like an idol. Treat them like another human being. And treat yourself like an equal. Because you are. And so, if you go into meetings with these really high-profile people. I was I was at the uh, Endemol offices yesterday. It's like a, a multi-billion dollar media empire. And they created, like, Survivor and Big mm. Brother and all these big reality shows. And I met with this really big writer and producer there. And I was wearing basketball shorts and a hoodie. Yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like this huge office with a like super fancy tables. He's wearing like a button up and all this stuff. And I'm in the basketball shorts and a hoodie. And it's, it's not, it wasn't because I was trying to pr prove something. It was just because I, that's how I dressed for the day. And then I got the meeting and whatever. But instead of stressing out about like, oh, I'm not presenting myself well or whatever. It's like, here's a guy. He's just a guy. Okay. He started out somewhere just like I did. And if I can just relate to him as a human being and just be a cool person and like be friends with him. He'll understand that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not people. I think, uh, it, it was really interesting because Silicon Valley really brought out a unique perspective to me. Um, because I remember someone said there, uh, they said, if you see someone's LinkedIn profile photo and they're in Silicon Valley and they're wearing a suit, they're compensating for their lack of skill. Huh. And so you see people like Mark really? Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg wears hoodie and jeans. Yeah. All the billionaires in Silicon Valley wear hoodies and jeans. And so if someone wears a suit in Silicon Valley, it's seen as a bad thing. Really? Yeah. And so it's like you're compensating for your lack of ability or your lack of skill or your lack to of experience. To prove yourself. By the way you dress. And that's not the case almost anywhere else. Um, but it taught me something about what's actually important to people. And so if you can just present, like if you can present yourself confidently, uh, it doesn't, it matters a lot less like what you're wearing, what your posture is, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm and just treat, with you. treating people like people. And where does confidence arise from, in your opinion? Certainty. Certainty. A hundred percent. Like I, I, it's funny because I, I talk to people all the time who are really good salespeople and they'll talk about all these different tactics that they use for sales. And I, I come from a background in sales and I know all the tactics, but I don't use hardly any of them because I don't need to, because what sells people is certainty. If I'm more certain than you are uncertain, I win. Huh. Right? So when I, when I walk into a meeting with somebody, if I'm more certain than they are uncertain of me, then I gain influence over the person. Right? So, Give me an example of how this comes along to life. So yesterday, uh, going back to that meeting again, right? Okay. So I was more certain that what I was presenting was a great idea than he was uncertain of my ability to deliver on it or uncertain of his, you know, his opinions on the idea. And, and it won him over to the way I felt, basically. So it's, it's walking into any... any uh, relationship opportunity, getting to know the person and understanding that you can provide value and having that certainty that you are someone of value. 
and that even if you don't know how you can help, you're going to find a way to help, and you have that certainty of knowing that you're that type of person who's going to find a way. Uh-huh. And that's going to help you build relationships with, with anybody, you know, especially high-profile people. Nice, nice. So what are your current projects today? What are you up to today? And uh, <clears throat> let's, tell, let's tell the audience about what, uh, what the new ventures are. So um, I'm launching a personal brand in the next week or so where I'm going to be offering for the first time uh, all of my insights into how to build a startup and how to raise money from angel investors, how to build the products like literally zero to 100. Um, I have companies where I source products from China and sold in retail stores. So literally whatever type of company someone wants to start, I'm going to teach them how to do that from zero to 100. So that's that's a really new, exciting project that I've been working on for a while now, and that's all launching within the next couple of weeks. So by the time this episode's up, yeah, it'll probably, it'll probably be live. Up. Yeah, yep. it'll probably be live. Yeah. Um, obviously, Hive is still going, um, so there's always work to be done there, and, and growing and retaining our user base and improving their experience. And then I'm uh, working on a couple other projects in e-commerce, and then I'm working on a really exciting uh, reality show project that's. Uh, that nobody really knows about yet. So, yeah. <laughs> Gotta keep it top secret. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what I'm working on for the most part. So, how do you keep how do you, how do you keep time? How do you make time for the people that matter in your life? How do you prioritize things when all of this is going on in your life? What do you do? What are, is, is there like a specific thing that you do that allows you to do it, or is like a bunch of factors in your life that you've applied? I'd say it's probably two things. The first is um, it's prioritizing. So, like. Uh, my flight back to Minnesota is today. So as soon as I get home, the rest of the day belongs to my family and all of tomorrow. So whenever I get back home from a trip, the entire day and the following day, that belongs to my family. If I'm leaving for a trip, the entire day leading up to the trip belongs to my family. So it's prioritizing that, even though I'm going to be missing out on, on work opportunities. Um, so you literally dump that completely. As best that I possibly can, yeah. Mm. And, I'm, and I'm honestly moving towards completely, yeah. I'd like to get to the point where I don't even have my phone on me. You physically turn off your phone and just... Uh, yeah, so that's that's where I'm moving towards. It's harder, a lot harder than it seems. I'm sure um, somebody with all yeah. your activities going around, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's where I'm moving towards. And then um, the other thing that uh, I would say is I only focus... I, that's kind of like the 80-20 rule. 20% of your activities generate 80% of your results. And so I only focus on those 20%. I cut out the entire other 80%. And if that means that there's loose ends or, you know, that details or whatever, somebody else can do those. Um, and I have staff, you know, fortunately that helps now. But even early on that, like, my philosophy has just always been, like, focus on what actually moves the needle. Everything else is just busy work. And so by only focusing on what moves the needle, you actually free up a lot of time, right? Because a lot of, a lot of the, the busy work and what makes you feel like you're working is not actually contributing that much to what matters. Hmm. So if you're only focusing on what moves the needle, then you have a lot more time. And that's how I'm able to do some, so many different projects at once and have them actually doing something is because I only focus on what actually moves the needle. Okay, I see, I see. All righty, man, well... Let's uh, end it off over here. I have, we usually end it out with like one special question that I ask people. It's interesting because okay. everybody has a different answer to it. It's very broad, generic, nothing crazy. But my question to you is, how do you find your vision? Not your why, your vision. I think your vision is based off of the experiences that you have in your life. And typically based off of the bad experiences. So my vision for the way that I want to live my life, my vision for the way that I want to change the world is based off of the negative experiences I've had in my life and with the world. Could you share with us a couple that you've been through that painted the picture for you? Yeah, so I mean my, my drive to be successful is because of my lack of, of financial, you know, like my lack of financial things in general, really, when I was growing up. I mean, I watched my mom, I watched us get kicked out of our house. I watched her go through foreclosure and bankruptcy. I watched, you know, like, I lived in the house where, you know, we had nothing to eat and we had, like, I didn't have anything. And I do not want that for my kids. Did you ever blame yourself for it growing up? 
No. Um, no, I, I don't. Interestingly enough, I didn't blame anybody. I, I don't think I was focused on placing blame. Um, but I was very aware of how much I did not like it. And I, how, how much I was determined to figure out some way of not putting my kids through that when I had a family. So you were thinking of your kids before? Before I had kids. Long before I had kids. Um, and so that, that's a part of my vision for success in general is from negative experiences I had in my, my life. Part of my vision for how I want to change the world with the education reform and with everything else is based off of, again, negative experiences I've had with that system, with, you know, uh, the, the reason why I'm launching, you know, my, my personal brand and the courses and things to help people is because I didn't have that. And I literally spent five years building something that should have taken me two. Like, I don't, I, I like to solve the problems I've had previously hmm. because I can relate to how painful they were. For others. Yeah. So your vision comes from the negative experiences you've had in your life. Mm -hmm. That I know other people also have. Now, so do you think a lot of problems. people? Do you think a lot of people have this issue where they think they're the only person that's going through this? Yes, yes, and uh, it was it was fascinating. <laughs> smile. <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> I, I was in a room of I don't know if you can call it a room, a stadium of ten thousand people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a room, yeah, a room of ten thousand, and uh, large, yeah, uh. and 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 uh, it's Tony Robbins, and he said um, he was talking to a lady who had depression, and he said uh, he said, "Do you feel like you're alone?" And she said, "Yes." And he said, "What makes you feel like you're alone?" And she said, "Well, I feel like I'm the only person who, you know, feels this way and like has this problem and experiences this." And he basically everything that she said of why she feels alone, he would ask the audience, how many of you also feel this, feel this way? The whole 10,000 people. Put their hand up. And she just started sobbing. And he's like, we're all human. Like we all go through the same things. The, our problems are not as uncommon as you think. We share almost all of them. And that was such a powerful thing. I was talking to my friend two days ago and he said that, um, his wife has social anxiety and so she she doesn't see her value because like you know like he was telling her she should start a podcast he's a very influential guy yeah and he's very well known and he was saying to his wife you know you, that you should start a podcast people want to hear what you have to say she said well i have social anxiety and he's like so does everybody else she's like no not like you know like mine's really bad and he put up on his instagram story in front of hundreds of thousands of people he's like does anybody else like do you have social anxiety yes or no 80 percent Yes. So whatever problems you have, most other people have. And I understand that there are exceptions to that. You know, like if you're paralyzed or if there's something horrible that's happened to you, I'm very sorry. But even still, there are people with remarkable, uh, I would call it, lives that started behind the start line. And they're still incredibly successful and fulfilled. You look at someone like Nick Santanastasso, right, who has no legs and one arm. And all these people who've impacted millions of people and they started from way behind the starting line but it's always it's always possible um i think it's finding your why it is and taking that why and impacting the world with it knowing that you're not alone because like like for me for example i always like because i do that a lot like when i at work on this podcast when i have an issue that i want to solve for anybody i relate to myself yeah. Like, if an employee comes up to me and is like, Adam, I don't know how to do this, I relate to myself, I'm like, hmm, if I was in his position or her position, what would I do? How would I feel? Because I realize that a lot of the time, we go through the same exact thing. We go through the same exact, maybe not the same literally step-by-step -step mental process of thinking things, but we see the world the same way everybody else sees it. Yeah. You know, and I personally had an issue going up up until I was about 18 where I would think the whole world was out there to get me. And I was like, oh, dang, dude, why is this happening to me? I would victimize myself. I'll yeah. put myself in a victim position. But then when I popped out of that bubble and I saw life from that different lens, I looked at everyone and I'm like, wow, everybody does the same thing. We all live in a society that we're just victims. We're like, and that's how we don't get anywhere because yeah. we're always just like, man, life sucks. Look for me, for me, for me, for me. It's always me, me, me. We have no time for everybody yeah. else. So. Well, and the easiest way to do that is to only focus on what you can't control. One of my favorite things is uh, I heard somebody once say, um, if 
if it's raining outside and two people walk into a store and they're wet because of the rain, uh, the, the person who is focusing on what they can't control will say, oh, I got wet because it's raining. And the person who's focusing on what they can control will say, oh, I got wet because I forgot to bring an umbrella. So uh, it's like, there's two perspectives to everything. Yeah. So like, choose, choose to focus on what you can control and choose to let go of what you can't control. Because if you can't control it, worry's like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it's not going to get you anywhere. So don't waste your time. I do think that's like the key to happiness. A big factor to it, at least. I think that's part of it, but I also think progress is probably the biggest key to happiness. Progress. Any amount of progress. In what? Professional career or just progress in everything, life? In general. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because everything's moving. And so if you're being stagnant, you're not actually, you're not being still. You're actually you're behind falling time. behind. Yeah, and that's when you feel the pressure from it. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. Well, is there, uh, so where can people find you on social media to keep up with what you're going on and what's coming up next with all this beautiful ventures that, that are popping up all of a sudden? So Yeah, so um, on Instagram, it's brett.knudsen. On Hive, it's just at brett. And uh, I'm not really on Twitter or Facebook. You can also follow me at brettknudsen.co. Is that like a website? Yeah. Oh, nice. Cool. Alrighty. Well, hey, I appreciate your time today. I really thank you so much for it. Alrighty, guys. Thank you so much for watching this episode. If you guys enjoyed, please remember to leave a like and comment your favorite part. Also, let us know if you guys like us to bring any specific guests on the show. We would be happy to deliver as much value as possible to all of you out there. Also, without further ado, remember to subscribe. Your support means the world to us. It's what keeps us motivated and driven to want to continue to create amazing episodes like this. And without further ado... It's your boy Adam signing out, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace. And that is a wrap. I appreciate you guys so much for tuning into this episode. And if you've made it this far, please remember to smash that like button and comment your favorite part, letting us know what you guys thought because your feedback is much appreciated. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, what are you doing? Join the movement. You want to know why? Because we're about to drop some awesome content with some fantastic guests with some value that's going to radically transform the quality of your life so you do not want to miss out. Also, finally, make sure to share this episode with 10 of your friends that you think will really value the things that were shared in this episode. You know, we're here to spread love, change people's lives, and do what's best for everybody. So make sure to share it as much as possible. And without further ado, I will see you guys later.